sorry. Isabella has been working as a teacher since 2013. Uh, she has started um, her career as a teacher trainer and coordinator this year. She has an English teaching specialist title from, uh, by FALE, UFMG, and a MA in Language Studies, Applied Linguistics by CEFETMG. And she is starting her PhD research in 2022 on text linguistics at UFMG. She holds uh, the Cambridge CELTA, TKT, CPE, and Trained Trainer Certificates. Thank you very much for being here with us. It's a pleasure, and I'm sure that everyone will enjoy this session. Please feel free. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, because I know that in some other places it's already the afternoon. I would like to thank everyone for taking the, the time. You know, it's a Sunday, we're all <laughs> tired, but these um, opportunities are, you know, priceless. So thank you for joining us and thank you for being here. And I hope uh, this session can be at least a little bit helpful for everyone. So uh, can I share my screen? Yes, right, second. Can you guys see? Yeah? But it's not like presenting mode, is it? Uh, yeah, it, now it is. Okay, all right. So as I cannot see the, the, the chat, I would like uh, for you guys, if you have any questions, you can interrupt me, that's okay. <laughs> all right, no need to, um, if you have a question or if you don't understand something, you can just interrupt me and then uh, I can try to answer. So just a second, I'm trying to make this smaller a minute. I'm not great with the Zoom. Okay. All right, guys. So um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about Paulo Freire's legacy, uh, critical uh, pedagogy in private language institutes. So this, um, this talk is actually based on uh, my master's research uh, where I studied critical possibilities in language institutes, the course book as a possible transformative tool. So I have finished this uh, research in 2020. Um, and today I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about the, the findings because Paulo Freire was the main theory that I used and I'm gonna explain why. So I'm going to start with this, uh, with this sentence because I, I think this is one of the, the things that have guided my, my train of thought for this research is no oppressive order could, could permit the oppressed to begin to question why. And for me, this makes a lot of sense because I feel that, um, especially in Brazil, but maybe all over the world, uh, uh, communities and uh, minorities that are oppressed. I feel like there's this whole politicians and politics scheme to keep these people so busy trying to survive that they don't have the option to, to ask why. And that's what they should do. And that's what I, I feel like there has been this change and people are uh, trying to, you know, even though it's a difficult living, they're trying to stand up for their rights. So uh, I'm going to start a little bit by telling um, the, the theory behind the research. So the first thing was critical pedagogy by Paulo Freire. I know that right now in ELT, there's lots of talk, um, lots of discussions and people talking about critical thinking, critical literacy, but I wanted to go to the, you know, the seed. I think that Paulo Freire and of course other authors uh, are, you know, the seed. They planted this seed many years ago and now ELT has been talking about it, but I feel like he 
uh, started it. And when I was in the process of doing my research, uh, I received, you know, some criticism, people saying that I shouldn't use Paulo Freire, I should use some more modern and current uh, theory, but it was a conscious decision for me to use it, uh, to use his theory. First reason, because I love Paulo Freire, I'm like the biggest fan. <laughs> and secondly, because I feel like the root of everything that we are discussing now started with him. So I got these, um, you know, some of these, um, these are actually chapter titles from his book, uh, Pedagogy of Freedom in Portuguese is Pedagogia da Autonomia. And uh, the, for me, this is a summary of what teaching is. So he mentions the first thing, intervention. So teaching requires the understanding that education is a way to intercede in the world. And I believe that us as teachers and teachers who are actually here today, Monday morning discussing, Monday, no, Sunday, sorry. Sunday morning discussing this, we, we believe that. And we try to do our, you know, share and, you know, we have this responsibility. Reflection, because teaching requires critical reflection upon our practice. So not only being up to date and knowing the, the ELT theory and methods, approaches, techniques and everything, but also critical reflection upon the things that we have been doing as teachers, but also as educators. He mentions that teaching requires joy and hope. For me, in uh, currently, hope is one of the biggest ones. Uh, conviction teaching requires that conviction uh, that change is possible. So, as as I said before, if we are here and if we are willing to learn, to share, and you know, to be better teachers and professionals, I believe that something that is probably common that we believe that change is possible and we want to do what we can to be this change and to facilitate the process for our students to, to change the world it's, uh, as well. Um, requires knowing how to listen. This is something that I feel is a challenge as, as an English teacher, you know, because we have that, you know, TTT that is insane and we have to always try to reduce our TTT. But not only that, but even when we're talking about things that are not necessarily target language and content, we need to be able to listen to our students because they have things to share. They have things to, uh, you know, they can help each other. They can help you. And I feel like this being uh, open to our students is something that's very important. Um, and teaching requires uh, acknowledging that education is ideological. So Paulo Freire has mentioned this and lots of authors have already mentioned that there's no neutral education. So I'm gonna talk uh, about that in a minute, but I 100% believe uh, that education is ideological. And if you do not take a stand, you are already taking a stand. All right, okay. So uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about the banking model of education because this is one of the bases of Paulo Freire's uh, theory. So I believe that most people already know a little bit about it, but when Paulo Freire uh, theorized this, he mentioned that um, traditional education worked like a bank. So the teacher would, uh, make deposits of knowledge into the, the learner's bank accounts. So we would be just, you know, depositing knowledge and the students uh, would receive this knowledge passively. Of course, this is not, he didn't write this regarding ELT, but it can be, you know, transferred. Uh, definitely. So that would be it, the banking model of education. Teachers only deposit uh, educations. They will uh, provide students with static knowledge and there's no room for uh, discussion. There's no room for um, reflection. 
And then uh, what he suggests is that this type of banking education is not, uh, doesn't take place any longer. And teachers and students together will uh, create and facilitate this opportunity for the learning, which is creative and dynamic and a process. So it shouldn't be just receiving static knowledge. It's more, uh, you know, talking and having the, the learning process as something that students are in charge. And in this case, there is the possibility of change and students can be heard and seen. And in this case, if students have a voice, they can question oppression and oppressive situations. They know that they are in a safe space in the classroom to learn, to develop themselves as learners and as human beings. And then they feel like they have this voice. So to do that, we need to be progressive educators. We need to be educators who believe in this possibility of change. And we believe in the role of a teacher as not just the knower of things and the person who knows everything, but understanding that this creative learning takes place when uh, we have this um, exchange and this sharing of knowledge and experiences. So uh, I really love this, um, this drawing because it's the teacher and the student rowing the boat together. The student is in front of the teacher and I feel like the teacher is looking at the student, you know, in a very, you know, cute way and like, okay, I'm here, I'm helping you if you need anything, but, you know, go ahead. So I feel like this encapsulates perfectly the idea of not having a banking uh, education. All right, something else that um, was very important for me in, in, the, in the research was critical applied linguistics. And uh, Penny Cook is probably the author that has written more about this. And he mentions that critical applied linguistics is more than just a critical dimension added to applied linguistics. So it's all about uh, questioning and um, you know, not accepting what is the norm and always you know, prob problematizing what's given and trying to connect the teaching to questions of gender, class, sexuality, race, etc. cetera. So um, this is something that's very important because we have to see access to language, in our case, English and second language, foreign language, as a way to, uh, give people access to spaces and bridge gaps because uh, sometimes minorities don't have access to this knowledge. And as we know, the English language nowadays is more than just a language, it's a way to, uh, to access spaces. So we need to be aware of that. And as you can see, the definition has everything to do with critical pedagogy. Um, and then Penny Cook also says that if this cultural differences and the fact that uh, learning a language can be, um, you know, uh, exclu exclusive for some, uh, we're not going to change the status quo because we need to acknowledge that and then do something to change this reality. Um, Okay, so this is the last uh, piece of theory that I used. I don't know if everybody knows the post method condition by Kumara Vajivelu. I think this is for me something that's like a complete turning point in ELT theory. I feel like the post method is amazing in terms of, you know, putting into words something that I feel lots of teachers who are progressive believe that is the fact that there is no best method and there's no, there shouldn't be one specific method or approach that works in every single context that works um, with every single student. 
I think that most of us believe that. And, um, and this uh, theory, this is, uh, he theorized this in saying that we shouldn't create an alternative method. This should be an alternative to method. So the post method pedagogy has three parameters and they are, so the first one, practicality. So there is this discussion of applied linguistics and teaching because the, the people who are in academia, the researchers, they were creating the theory and the teachers would only consume that knowledge passively. And we know that even though the theory from uh, academia is, okay, great, Teachers uh, deal with the, the experience. Teachers deal with the day-to-day -day inside the classroom. So we have lots of knowledge as well and experience. So there shouldn't be this dissociation between the theory and the practice. So um, this is something that puts you know, teachers in a marginalized position, uh, in a position that we only have to receive this knowledge from, you know, top to bottom and use the methods that were created in somewhere else, not inside the classroom, maybe. So this means that there should be this link between the theory and the practice and teachers should be, you know, we should have ownership of the knowledge. And if we have this knowledge and this experience, we should be the one to make the decisions. Uh, the other parameter is particularity. This is something that is very interesting because we know that every group of students is different. We may have in the same semester, the same groups and they are completely different because the individuals in these groups are different people. So um, having this uh, idea that each particular group has their own goals, their own social cultural backgrounds, their own needs, their own um, strengths and weaknesses. So this will help us make good choices for our students. And the last parameter is possibility. I have highlighted this one because this is, you know, very close to Paulo Freire's theory. Uh, when Kumara Vajivelo wrote this, he even mentions that this is based on it because this would be the, the parameter that involves empowering learners to critically, critically reflect on social and historical conditions. So this would be teaching that would allow students, in this case, uh, language teaching, English teaching, that allows students to reflect and to question, uh, you know, the colonial constructs, to uh, question the status quo and everything that has been happening in the world. So for me, this is really interesting. I think this theory is so amazing. Actually, he started writing about it in 94 and, you know, it's been a really long time and this hasn't, you know, became, uh, it hasn't become a, a trend, but I feel like something very interesting. And I strongly suggest that if you're interested in critical pedagogy and Paulo Freire, that you take a look at Kumara Vajivelo's uh, work. All right. So I'm gonna talk about the research in like the actual research. So that was my theory. That's what, that was the theory that I studied to conduct the research. Uh, so the first thing, the context that we have to um, think about is in Brazil, we have regular schools and we have private language institutes. In, in Brazil, they are called cursos livres, which would be something like a free course, uh, not in free as in free, but <laughs> so these private language institutes, um, these are English schools. So we only teach English or language in these schools. So students go to their regular schools that may be public or private and students who do have access to these language schools, they will go there to 
to learn English, you know, not in a more effective way, because I do believe that students can learn English in regular schools, but they can have more contact with the language. And there is this misconception in Brazil that you can only learn a language in a private language school, but that's not true. But that's not the case. That's not the point here. So um, as I mentioned, regular schools and critical pedagogy, Paulo Freire and all of this are really, uh, this is something that is discussed in the public school in Brazil. But the, the language schools, we don't talk about that as much. We talk about critical literacy and critical thinking, but we don't talk about Paulo Freire. So that's why I mentioned before that I've made this conscious decision to, okay, I want Paulo Freire to be my main source of theory because I believe it all started with him. So the research, uh, I actually, I interviewed 15 teachers, 15 English teachers in Belo Horizonte, um, in Gerais in Brazil, between uh, September uh, 2019 and January 2020. So it was before the pandemic. I was actually thinking about that if maybe the answers would be different after the pandemic. Uh, so these 15 teachers, they worked in six different language schools and 11 different branches because some schools have different branches. And I've analyzed uh, their, their answers, not using discourse analysis, analysis, but using content analysis. So uh, what they said, the content of their answers, what was analyzed by me. It was very important that the teachers who were interviewed uh, knew that no value judgment was being made, like there were no right or wrong answers. I just wanted to know their opinions and how, you know, their, how they worked. And it was interesting because there were lots of different realities and contexts of teaching and still there were so many similarities, um, you know, among the, the answers that I've got from the teachers. So the, the, main, the most important thing for me in this research was considering this. If I was going to ask teachers who work uh, in private language institutes, in a specific city in Belo Horizonte. And in this city, uh, mostly people who have access to these um, language schools are people with money. People who have not lots of money, but money to spare. So they can pay for this. In many cases, this could be, the, these people could be considered the oppressor because they, in some cases, they are the elite. But it was important for me to do this. And I believe for these people it's also important to know how to develop critical thinking skills because they need to question their status quo. They need to know that if they don't make a change and they don't question you know, uh, the social injustices, they are you know, uh, doing that as well. They are not doing anything to change. And this might be tricky, you know, people told me, are you sure you want to do that? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> but this could be tricky, you know, you putting kids that are in a privileged situation to make sure that they know they are privileged and they should do something about it. So that's what I wanted. But also we have to think that depending on the situation, uh, they could feel oppressed as well. But I feel like this is something that it's not that important as the fact that they should recognize their priv privileges and they should recognize that it's their responsibility to fight against social inequalities and injustice. So I asked uh, questions for the teachers, the 15 teachers about course books, like how they use the course books, uh, which methods and approaches they use in class and how these methods and approaches influence the way they use the course books. If they believe the English teacher is an educator, the importance of helping students develop critical thinking, if they know what uh, you know, critical pedagogy is um, and like what would be the problems of trying to develop critical thinking in classroom, 
And I, then I gave them a lesson, a course book class, and asked them to describe how they would teach that. And then I asked them what they would do differently if their goal was to help students develop critical thinking skills. So I'm not gonna talk about all of the, the questions, um, but I'm gonna talk about the most important for what we are discussing today. So this one was, do you think it's important to help students develop their critical thinking skills? And all 15 teachers answered yes. And the answers were similar in terms of teachers saying that the classroom is a safe space to discuss and share opinions. It should be, right? And we can listen to each other, listen to different points of views uh, and respect, you know, respect and politeness are things that should be taken into consideration inside the classroom. And us as teachers should uh, help, uh, help, teach, uh, help students keep the dialogue going. And seven teachers out of these 15 mentioned that the main reason for fostering critical thinking would be to help learners think for themselves and not only reproduce what they hear. This is where I kept thinking about the pandemic. If this would change, you know, because seven teachers said that. And then I thought maybe living a pandemic, this would make more teachers feel like this, that if we can uh, help our students think for themselves, not help them as in telling them what they have to think, but helping them uh, know that they have a voice and they should be heard, maybe um, we have already accomplished something in class. All right, so uh, what can we take from the answers from the teachers? So most of them believe that uh, this, critical thinking fostering is important and why should we do that? To help students be more independent. So learning a, a second language, the purpose of it is to communicate in real life context. So the language in the classroom should be the least artificial as possible. And learners must be an active part of their educational and learning process by questioning, participating and making decisions. And this is very interesting because None, uh, none of the teachers knew Paulo Freire's theory. When I asked them what critical pedagogy was, most didn't know. Only one teacher mentioned Paulo Freire, but this teacher didn't know the theory. So they didn't know Paulo Freire, but this what they mentioned that students must be active parts of their education and learning process. It's very similar to what Paulo Freire uh, presented in his, uh, in his work. Um, all right, so let's move on. So in terms of how to promote critical thinking skills, uh, teachers mentioned basically speaking activities, you know, like talks, discussions, debates, talking about current topics, such as environmental issues, because when I interviewed the teachers, uh, there were lots of fires going on. There were fires in Australia, in Brazil. So this environmental issues was something that was very strong. Um, and all of the teachers mentioned personalization, which is a great strategy because we know that if we do that, we make our students feel uh, heard because they're comfortable about talking about themselves most of the times, but I feel like this is a question we should ask ourselves. Is personalization the same as critical thinking? Because not necessarily. Asking a student to talk about themselves, it's not necessarily helping them to develop critical thinking skills. Uh, the problems that the teachers uh, mentioned that could happen while trying to do that in class would be students have low, low levels of fluency, in some cases. Um, sometimes you have difficult and important content to teach. Uh, for example, if you're teaching, I don't know, present perfect, which is very challenging for Brazilian students, then you wouldn't have time to do something extra. And it requires creativity and planning. So these were the issues that the teachers mentioned that could happen. So in terms of, uh, okay, we have these issues, they're all valid. So how can we do things to help our students 
uh, be more critical and be more engaged and take ownership of their learning process. It doesn't have to be a whole class, you know, about that. But these are some, you know, small things that we can do to help our students, you know, like allowing them reflection time, because sometimes we ask a question, then we want our students to answer right away, promoting interaction, using real life issues, you know, bringing to the classroom things that are happening in real life, asking open-ended questions to give students the opportunity to think and answer, promoting creativity, decision-making, it's very important, even if it's the little things, you know, allow students to make choices, um, encourage respectful debating, get students out of their comfort zone. So try to uh, have these discussions and things like that, but students have to think um, differently than their actual opinion, because this would help them think outside the box, you know, provide opportunities for problem solving validate students' points of view and feelings, even if they are different than your own and the other, you know, classmates, they should feel validated and heard. Uh, listen to your students and learn from them. This is something that's very important. Everyone who has experience in the classroom knows that you can learn so much from your students. So give them this opportunity, let them teach you. Create a safe environment where students know they are uh, safe and comfortable and they can give their opinions and they can make mistakes. And also don't stay still, don't assume you know everything because we don't. So be always open to the endless possibilities that may arise. So these are some suggestions. Actually, uh, yesterday, um, in the, the last um, talk, uh, Chris, Eli, and Janaina were talking about the course books and how difficult it is to, you know, some course books are so biased and structured and how would we develop critical thinking using this? So I feel like these, uh, these books provide us opportunities to, you know, have discussions and have, uh, moments to question like, okay, what's wrong with this picture? Okay, so we have a picture of a woman cleaning and the man watching TV. So let's talk about this. Use the, the issues that are there and create opportunities. So I feel like this adapting of the course book can create many great opportunities. <clears throat> so I also asked the teachers if they consider uh, English teachers to be educators and all of them do. In Brazil, we have something that some English schools hire teachers as instructors instead of teachers because they then they can pay less. Uh, and that's already an issue in itself. I'm not gonna go there. But in some cases, um, these instructors, they may not feel like they are educators. One of the teachers who, who was interviewed said that when she started teaching as an instructor, she didn't see herself as an educator. She thought that she was there just to, you know, deposit knowledge into the students' minds. But then she realized that she had a, a bigger and more responsible job as a teacher. So, um, and then other teacher says that being inside the classroom presupposes being an educator. That's the teacher's job. It is to educate. And I feel like this is important because seeing yourself not only as an English teacher, but also as an educator, this uh, is very important because sometimes you may have a, a teacher who thinks it's not their responsibility to educate students. Of course, I'm not talking about raising kids and giving them you know, manners and things like that. But we, it, it is our job to educate our students. Not, we're not the only ones who have to do that, but we do. We have to be there for them. Um, and then I asked teachers, like, uh, which restrictions are there to your practice? So if you want to foster critical thinking, which restrictions do you face? And 
lots of teachers said that they avoid controversial topics such as religion and politics to safeguard themselves as a teacher, you know, to avoid problems with parents, with students. And um, so they try to be neutral. But as Paulo Freire said, there's no such thing as neutral education. It uh, functions as an instrument to bring about conformity or freedom. So if you avoid something, maybe you are already taking a stand. So Paulo Freire says that for education to be neutral, there shouldn't be disagreements regarding social and individual ways of life. And we know there are so many, especially nowadays, uh, 2022, when things are so, you know, crazy. <laughs> so for education to be neutral, everything should be, you know, the same, and it's not. So if you avoid certain topics, and if you avoid um, being an educator, then you are taking a stand. I'm not saying that you should discuss religion, politics, and class, and you know, don't care about uh, school's rules. That's not it. We don't have to talk about politics exclusively to help students develop their critical thinking skills. All right. Okay, so uh, I've talked a little bit about it before, but these are just some ideas how to use the course book as a tool to help us promote critical thinking, adapt, supplement, don't ignore the issues. Like I said, you have a picture, you have a text that's full of uh, things that could be problematic. Talk about it and facilitate the process for students to be in charge. So if they hate doing the writings from the course book, okay, we're not gonna do that. Okay, do you have an idea? So what else can we do? And you know, have students bring these ideas and you know, but don't don't um, be strict and rigid with your course book usage. Guys, of course, I'm talking about situations in which you have this freedom. We know that in some schools things have to be done exactly in a specific way. And I'm not saying that you should do things differently and then get fired. No, it's just like, if you have this opportunity, these are some things that you can do. Oops, wait, all right. So I'm gonna end this uh, presentation with this um, saying by Paulo Freire that education is an act of love and thus an act of courage. I feel like this is more current than ever. This is something that is makes total sense for us in in Brazil and in other places as well. But we should be resilient. We should know that our job as teachers uh, has an impact and we can make a difference. And it's not about, okay, I'm going to develop my students' critical thinking skills. You cannot do that. You cannot develop someone else's anything, but you can help them. You can facilitate the process of helping your students be uh, more critical and question the, the status quo and question inequalities and how things are, you know, in the world. And that's it. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to me. It was a pleasure sharing a little bit. You know, I'm very passionate about all of this. So it was great talking to you. And if you have any further questions or if you want to talk more about it, don't hesitate to get in touch. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. And uh, I totally agree with you that addressing and talking about the topics, they are not like necessarily to show even your point of view and things like that, but you can help them think about what they see, yeah? So we can bring facts, not only showing our point of view of things, but helping them discuss, finding different alternatives, uh, what you did about showing uh, students that they are in a privileged position, yes? We should do that. I believe many times they don't, they live in a bubble 
And we as educators, uh, it's part of our duty to show them and to and not show in a position that we know when we are showing them, but come on, look around, look what you have here. Even uh, when you have like a, a snack time if you're a student and then you say, come on, see, look, everyone here can bring a snack, bring something, do things that common to everyone, but developing this, I, I, I totally think uh, like, very similar to the way you, you presented here, uh, teaching a similar situation of the schools. And that's it. I really believe we have to spread that and show that we are. And when you we address these topics, it doesn't mean that we need to impose our position or do something like that. It's being able to address. Yeah, so, and yes depending on the situation we know schools and your job and everything but we we can find ways to do that in a light way and you know i just asked i didn't say anything i just pointed out uh, 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 yeah so thank you very much for enlightening that i, I totally agree with you thank you it's, i think it, th this uh opportunity is for us to share and you know talk to people um of course, we need to be in touch with people who have uh, different mindsets and opinions, but sometimes it's also very, you know, uh, like it's like a hug <laughs> talking to people who share our views and points and, and things that we believe, because mm -hmm. I feel like now more than ever, we need that as well. We need that. That's good. <laughs> we do. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. So, people, thank you. It was a pleasure to have you here in this Sunday morning. Please feel free to open your microphones and share with us. Um, we have a next session. I have just pasted the program, the 10A, 10B, uh, there, the request certificate attendance. You are open to do that. Everything is here in the chat.